Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we're going to be talking with Yasser Ali, who is the co-founder and CEO of Polymer. Polymer is a no-code platform that prevents sensitive data leaks across SaaS apps such as Google Drive, Slack, Microsoft Teams, and Zoom without slowing down an organization's operations. We're going to talk about how Polymer does that and what else it can do. But before we do that, we're going to welcome Yasser. Yasser, how, old are, you, how are you today? Not how old are you? <laughs> how are you doing today, Yasser? <laughs> I'm probably older than you, but uh, Mark, thanks so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Well, um, thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Hey, um, whereabouts are you located? Uh, New York City. Okay. How how are things in New York? Is everything back to normal or where? Yeah, where, man. How's, yeah. Even with the with the risk high, masks are off and uh, people are uh, living the life. And uh, yeah, the 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 pent up demand is is back in full swing now. So it's it's a pretty pretty normal. So um, let me ask you a little bit about um, Polymer. So first off, you're a no-code platform. Um, what does that mean, no-code? Uh, essentially, you don't need to involve developers for configuration, integration, setting up the platform, or start using it. Um, any somewhat technically savvy but doesn't know how to code, or even a business person who has subscribed to a SaaS platform with their credit card and set it up maybe um, on their computer uh, should be uh, have enough technical knowledge to get uh, going with our platform. Okay. So that's how we look at no code in general, and that's how that's why we market ourselves as a no code platform. So this is this is something that uh, basically anybody, even if they don't have much of a technical background, they can help deploy. Now, what what you're trying to do is prevent data leaks um, from some of these SaaS apps that I mentioned before. Um, let's before we tie all this together, let's talk about what a data leak is. I mean, if I'm using Google Drive, what kind of data leak should I be worried about? Uh, so there are two kinds of uh, data leaks. Uh, uh, data. One aspect of of this is internal. Another aspect of is is external facing. So. Um, let's focus on the external, which is a much more uh, easy to understand concept. Uh, so information from your organization leaving your virtual premises uh, to an external party. Um, this could be in the form of, for the example of Google Drive, a link you're sharing with a, an external contractor, um, external customer or a partner, or just some random person on the street or to your own uh, personal domain, personal email address. Uh, and that file could have your customer data, your patient data, or your secrets of your company, for example, or could be even code bases. And uh, so that's an example of an external facing data leak where actually information is leaking out or exiting um, your Google Drive uh, environment. The well, well, wait a minute. I mean, if, if, if I share that document with somebody, how is that a leak? Um, and maybe, maybe I'm missing something here. If I, if I, because you know, when I'm in Google Drive, I have the option to send somebody a link to it or just share yeah. and then they get the, the alert and then they can click on the link. But anyway, how, how is that a leak? If so I'm you choosing can, to yeah. So if you, for example, make that document to be a public sharing link. Okay. Um, it could you share it with one person. That person can share in effect uh, to someone else okay. uh, without restriction. Um, so you are essentially gotcha. putting that document at risk for anyone to open or at least view. Okay. Now in Google Drive or some of these other SaaS apps that 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 you mentioned, there are options oftentimes to to limit only to the recipient or and give and, and you can limit the rights to them. But are you are you assuming them then that the person who's sharing the document just you know maybe they 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 don't have the time or they just inadvertently send it out as an open uh, shareable document? Um, yeah. So human sloppiness and laziness is one of the major factors for information uh, ransomware leakage of data across the board. So don't have the time is one generous reason. 
uh, <laughs> uh, to, to, the, to, you, to an employee. Yeah. Uh, usually, it ends up becoming also uh, there's a time value around information sharing. So you're on a project, you're sharing a document as a restricted link for a given project, let's say, or a folder which has multiple documents within it. Your project ends, and then guess what? Two years down the road, that link is still sitting out there um, for someone in the new company who is taking over from that employee would have access to it, which you might not necessarily want. Or you've shared a folder uh, on a setting which allows the third party to inspect the data, but as you add new documents in, within that folder environment, even those become visible just the way the IAM policy of Google Drive or even OneDrive works. So it just opens your information up uh, for perpetuity um, for looking and, and using, which you might not want as a company. Absolutely. And I totally agree with you that the, uh, the to use the not so charitable word, the sloppiness is a cause for, for many, many data leaks. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it's people just are, you know, kind of everybody's rushed and kind of overwhelmed sometimes and they happen to send off they don't even think about it sometimes and that's where some of some of the systems some of the dlp systems out there and you know outlook has it and so on that are excuse me office 365 they will if you if you configure it in the right way um it will alert you to hey are, who are you sending this to um is it you know external internal and so on and so forth in the case of polymer um let's assume that i'm using you know google drive or one of these other apps um what's what's the user experience going to be when i start to share a, a document with somebody either outside my organization or even into inside my organization so our focus has been to not interfere in terms of how uh these SaaS apps work uh, so we we made a very uh, uh methodical uh, mission to be as uh, least as least in, in invasive as possible. So as a as an employee, when you're doing your work on a Google Drive or Slack or other environments, you basically you you're not uh, changing the how you operate. Um, however, let's say as an employee, you share a file uh, with someone externally, and your data loss or your data governance. Uh, policies do not allow you to share certain types of files, for example, let's say if it's a image of a poster you're working on, which doesn't have any sensitive data, that's a type of asset which probably is a low risk or no risk in terms of sharing because you're collaborating on a design project, for example. So mm -hmm. you can create as an admin uh, or as a business executive in, in the C a CEO, for example, can set up these policies within Polymer where it can kill the links or downgrade links uh, if someone is sharing a public link having uh, for a file having PII data or PHI data, which is personal identifiable information. So having specific social security numbers or other types of data specific to your organization, which you think to be your crown jewels, those files you would want your employees to share in a, in a direct private or restricted fashion rather than as a public link. Or you can even design uh, rules where Let's say you are uh, sharing and you are working with, let's say, your external HR team, uh, for example. You still don't want those links to be open all the time, so you can create uh, expiration uh, rules around if a file has sensitive data or if a file has employee data, I want that to kind of expire after five days. Or if, a if there's some financial data found in the document, I want that to expire in two weeks, for example, and I'd want all my public links to expire having sensitive data immediately. So within five minutes or within a few minutes, if anyone shares a link, it will all automatically get downgraded. Um, and this is kind of way how we are kind of uh, reducing that human risk in terms of how they use the SaaS platforms. Okay, so can your, can your platform actually detect, for example, uh, PII or let's just say, you know, um, credit card information or social security numbers, can you actually detect that? Correct. So our platform is basically not just looking for events around sharing, but there is a every single piece of document within your Google Drive, within your Slack, any environment we're connecting into. Uh, the Polymer basically is uh, is inspecting the, the traffic, the data. We run apply NLP 
uh, regular expressions and, and all sorts of ML rules on top of it um, to pluck out and label documents which are sensitive as well as understanding what's within that document. So it could be highly, highly prescriptive in terms of what policies, what types of data you're looking at in designing your data loss policies. So, and I, and I get how um, tools can identify, for example, social security numbers, uh, credit card numbers. Uh, how does a system go and, and detect that, hey, you know what, this information may fall under HIPAA or may fall under GPR, GDPR? Yeah, so just a little bit background in terms of how DLP systems historically have worked, even now mm -hmm. work 90 plus percent uh, systems in the in the market. Um, they, they usually are based on regular expression. So you set up patterns around social security pattern around, I need three numbers followed by a dash, followed by two numbers, followed by a dash and three numbers or four numbers, right? So that's a pattern of a regular expression where you are looking for social security number. And sometimes that gets confused with a telephone number, for example, or ID card number in some cases. Uh, so those pattern uh, matching based approaches has been kind of uh, failed, especially in the cloud and the SaaS setup, where amount of unstructured data, where um, and and these patterns can create a lot of false positives. In general, historically, DLP systems get you 60 plus 60 percent accuracy is the rough benchmark, and one of the biggest reasons why that is the case, and and the market has been so. Um, burned by the over promises from a DLP players has been the, the, the core uh, piece missing has been because their uh, focus has been on regular expression based pattern matching. Mm -hmm. So modern platforms like ours, um, and, and I think we are one of the unique ones in the market, our focus is applying pre-trained um, NLP models on these data sets to get to a higher level of fidelity in, in differentiating between a social security number, a telephone number. Um, uh, we would look at for a set of rules um, in saying in, in ensuring uh, that the document is HIPAA compliant or not, uh, or it might have uh, certain entities found on them like Medicare ID or first name and last name, followed by Medicare ID and rate of birth, those three strings combined might make that to be a HIPAA uh, uh, relevant information. Uh, if you're trying to do the same work with regular expression, um, you probably cannot even conceivably do that because you would look for a Medicare ID, but then if Medicare ID is not followed by date of birth or a name, then that kind of gets in a gray area, which might not be HIPAA um, enforceable, for example, that infraction. So NLP does give us a lot of power and some ML build, built around NLP and free train models allow us to get to a little bit, uh, get to pretty much on, on, on real-time use cases, 85 to 90% 90, 90 plus accuracy. Thank you, that was an excellent explanation. Um, I'm not a technical person at all, and I think I understand what you're saying. And basically, with regex expressions, they're looking at individual units of information. Uh, with NLP, you're able to look at those different informations, but actually in the context of how they are kind of positioned together or related with each other and then identify the, the 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 patterns there that hey you know what this is probably something that falls under HIPAA or GDPR etc so that's um thank you for that explanation that's that's awesome sure. yeah. uh, um let me ask you then so w when you're out uh, talking with your with your customers are they primarily concerned about again? Is it the you know the in, insider sloppiness, or is it people who are disgruntled or trying to do something kind of, you know, that they shouldn't be doing? So, I would break it down into three different categories. Uh, one is obviously uh, regulatory, uh, where HIPAA demands uh, controls around data protection. So if, as organizations are moving to the cloud, uh, what they're realizing is legacy DLP players, um, uh, platforms cannot handle just the high amount of throughput and the data traffic and just the sharing and collaboration going on over these platforms um, and applying an old legacy platform to these new workflows and new systems 
which is SaaS, it just does not work. So we get, obviously, I want to be HIPAA compliant, but I still want to use SA, uh, Slack, for example, or I want my Google Drive to be HIPAA compliant or OneDrive to be HIPAA compliant. Uh, they will uh, 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 license our product, integrate with those platforms, um, and that's a checkbox around the regulatory uh, perspective for healthcare companies. For financial services companies, you could have PCI compliance, uh, which is another, um, uh, which is a less of a use case because PCI compliance generally means uh, making sure that uh, payment data of your customers is secure, what is going on in the marketplace. And I'll just take a small tangent. Those PCI compliance, like, typically is less relevant around SaaS for unstructured data because those are more related around payment gateways and payment information, which is mostly being done through APIs, where Stripe might handle most of the uh, holding of the of the actual transaction and credit card numbers, and you will just get a token which you're working with. So, uh, but PCI is definitely one use case that do come. Uh, and and you know, second category of this is from a non-regulatory perspective is data governance program. What we are seeing, C-suite executives are waking up is um, they have no idea what's transacting, what's flowing through these platforms, who's doing what. And in general, there is a market recognition that uh, we just need to have visibility into what kind of documents, what kind of data, uh, our company data is leaving the premises, how it's being used in these platforms. So that's number two. Um, and related to that, obviously, is um, around inside a threat of sloppiness, uh, people trying to steal information or just doing stupid stuff and just regular data hygiene. Excellent. So, um, you you know, you brought up visibility. Um, so does that imply then that the, you know, your your admin, your security, one of your security team is going to be able to kind of monitor the, you know, the different data flows, detect anomalous behavior, or maybe not even anomalous, but behavior that has been kind of uh, policies have have been set to say that, you know, if somebody is sharing this type of document from from this app, that we need to take a look at it and reach out to the person, or you know, give me give me a little bit of um, kind of insight into that. Sure. So it could this could be a security person, or it could even be a general counsel or a compliance person, actually. Um, because we have seen uh, the world of data governance and compliance and general counsels kind of merging with some of the information security teams in um, uh, in, in the market. Uh, the uh, the idea is that we've built a platform that if you're going to start alerting for every single violation, there will be an overwhelming uh, uh, items to look at and inspect as a human being or a team of human beings. And that is kind of where the regular expression based products have failed is there has been a violation fatigue by the infosec participants or the uh, or infosec teams within um, any kind of uh, uh, size organization um, especially in healthcare financial services and some of the more regulated industries so um, infosec teams literally uh, in the market using legacy solutions would not even look at the violations on a daily basis because they're like, there's so many, we can't even, we can't <laughs> even bother to look at them. So we have designed the platform in such a way that um, uh, the InfoSec team only gets involved for higher risk or uh, more uh, time sensitive kind of violations. Uh, for example, the whole, uh, the, the product is designed in such a way that an employee sharing something um, they need to share it. They can override the the blocking if it happens by the platform saying, no, I accept the risk. I want to move this forward or I'm going to put a time limit on it so I can actually send it to someone. If someone is sharing sensitive data in a chat platform like Slack, um, the, there will be a real-time redaction of sensitive data, which can then be unlocked by the person who needs to see it. So there's a various um, workflows we have included to allow employees to continue doing their work without having to wait for the infosec team to unlock or unquarantine the items, which has been the biggest stickler in this whole data protection uh, regime uh, so far. Um, so that's that's kind of a few examples how, how we solve that. 
Excellent. So I imagine that when you have an initial conversation with a prospective customer, you know, you, you ask them about what different SaaS apps they're using. Um, and then, then the, the other part would be, you know, which, what, what type of data are you sharing on these apps or do you hold on these apps? And, um, and then what kind of regulatory bodies are you kind of, you know, working towards a kind of compliance posture towards? Um, is there anything else that you discuss? Um, just the number two item, when you ask about what kind of documents are being transacting, usually you, 90% of the uh, folks will say, we don't know, to be honest. <laughs> so that visibility okay. is kind of very important. Um, and generally that ends up becoming, uh, the core use case, uh, even before the number three item around regulatory issues, some retail companies might not care about regulatory issues, for example, right? So they're more concerned about just data governance or data hygiene in, in, in general, especially around remote work, especially around organization with employees sitting outside the networks and they're using mm -hmm. unsecured Wi-Fi, for example. So this starts becoming a very um, a dominant uh, piece of conversation with this new um, way people are working. Um, and, and, and the other aspect of this is around, um, you know, um, uh, risk management, right? Infosec risk management. Um, what is my risk of data exposure today? Uh, and what can, how can that be reduced um, if I use Polymer, for example? So that's kind of how the conversation kind of usually, usually goes. Excellent. And then, you know, if there's an interest there, do you typically set up some type of POC or a trial um, or, or, you know, how does that work? So we have customers who come to our website and use our freemium uh, product, which they can st install themselves. It really takes uh, less than a minute to install on most platforms and they can kind of get going uh, within minutes uh, uh, for the most part. Um, and obviously the larger enterprise customers, uh, they require a little bit more kicking the tires. They come in, we set them up with a POC, which takes about a 15 minute phone call uh, once that's set up and um, then we evaluate after a weekend and and uh, uh, usually within a two week POC, we can, um, you know, if they want to move forward um, for larger enterprises, we might have a slightly different installation mechanism rather than a very, very small company. So those are the things which happens after the POC, but getting started really is uh, super trivial and, and we try to make it uh, a, a minute's uh, uh, work rather than like hours or anything anything beyond that. Is there is there any end user or training required or just you know because if if I if I'm working for a company and all of a sudden um, they start using a, a, a new tool a DLP tool and I get this alert saying hey you know we've redacted yeah. this information I might be a little bit like kind of put off or get surprised what's the process or what's the best practice around rolling it out no I funny you ask that that's an excellent question actually um we did run into that in early days and uh, um and and that was a that was a big uh, that forced us to actually to solve this problem by uh, doing a silent mode where the admin or the general counsel or the infosec team installing it can just monitor traffic and give uh, give a um, knowledge graph and reports around what kind of data is there, who's doing, who's the highest risk users you have, all done silently without anyone even seeing the platform um, alert or send warnings or send emails or send Slack or Teams messages saying you did X, Y, and Z. And that is usually the uh, first week POC and number second week of POC is we're not doing any auto remediation. Um, we're just doing warnings. So if someone shares a file, we will let it go through. Nothing will happen, but they will get a message. Uh, activities you did. This put uh, this put this amount of company data at risk. So and then at, at the end of two weeks, uh, some customers feel that warnings is enough to reduce the risk they have. And some, uh, usually more on the regulatory side, might say we want to switch on the remediation now um, and try it out for uh, for the for for week three of the POC. So usually the, those are the two parts after the silent mode. That makes a lot of sense. I, I like that phased approach, and it kind of you know it goes. You're testing out the tool, fine tuning it, creating awareness, 
and hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, companies that are doing this in a smart manner will be doing some internal messaging, you know, why we're doing this, what are the, all of us for doing this, you know, um, in, in, in kind of in conjunction with just the rollout, but, uh, makes a lot of sense. Hey, um, gotta, gotta ask you, what's your, um, if you don't mind sharing, like you, how, you know, your kind of fee model pricing model, how does that work? So it's a uh, per user per month, uh, you know, uh, uh, usually for mid-sized customers, um, anywhere between uh, roughly around four dollars per user per month. It, it slides down for higher number of uh, employees in the organization. For for less than hundred employees, we have a pretty low fixed price of ninety nine dollars a month, um, and that could be pretty much unlimited number of uh, integrations as needed. Um, so we have uh, we have a very low priced option to for the very smallest companies to get started. And then for enterprises, uh, it's 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 based on, uh, you know, per users, but in terms of how many integrations. So that's a more negotiated price. OK, when you meet integrations, you're talking about the different SaaS apps that um, that will you your that Polymer will be kind of monitoring. Yeah. So, I mean, for us, per user per month, uh, anywhere between two to four dollars for large enterprise customers is standard. Um, but they might have like, OK, we want an on prem install or we want to install on, on our own cloud environment, for example, for, for whatever reason, if, for highly regulated indust uh, uh, industry companies, they won't want a DLB solution on their premises, for example. They don't want us touching their data or, or, or coming through any of the uh, wires. Uh, externally beyond their own cloud environment. So that that requires a little bit of a setup or, or discussion for the very large enterprise customers. Okay, makes a lot of sense. It sounds very, very reasonable. I mean, I know if I was a CISO uh, at a large enterprise, I'd be looking for all the help I could get. <laughs> so yeah. there's just so many different apps and so much di different type of data out there, different regulatory bodies. And, and then with the whole remote work, you know, kind of trend, uh, that is, you know, seems to only not be slowing down, but just even accelerating. Um, I I would hate to have that job, actually. But uh, if I had that job, I would be looking for tools like this. Um, let me ask you, uh, just this is kind of jumping tracks a little bit. What advice would you have for consumers, just individuals out there? Because, you know, at the end of the day, we, we all work for companies, but we also are individuals, right? Um, and if I'm using... Google Drive or or Zoom uh, Teams, and I am sharing files. Is without without adopting a tool like Polymer, or maybe that's the only answer. But are there any other ways that I can kind of protect my data? I, th I think I, you know, I personally use some very basic heuristics. For example, a very simple thing to do is obviously, you know know who you shared the data with, all that stuff. I mean, I'm assuming everyone knows that, but just in terms of organization, my Google Drive, um, anything um, anything which I share uh, a file with any external person or anyone outside of myself, for example, I will give a separate, like all caps, label to the folder name, for example, public dash customer files, public dash marketing. Uh, and the idea is that if I wanna share something, I'm gonna drop, my file into that folder and go into that folder and sh only share that file with specific individual I'm going to share with. So at least I know where my external links are sitting, um, at least just by visually looking at my Google Drive environment, right? And never share a folder, always share individual files. Um, that's the basic. And um, try to do some um, manual um, you know, go back in time and just like remove the links after a while because uh, those things just keep adding up. And that's a that's a data debt you take on personally where you might be sharing stuff with people, you know, you already had a fallout on five years ago and they still have access to your <laughs> story files. Um, and, and especially as, as a lot of people are working independently and as contractors, it's more, it's m so much more important. And, and as an individual, I would say that people, you know, might not appreciate like, but if I receive a file from someone which says like, okay, marketing slash uh, 
proposal slash external and externals is on call, call caps, kind of how we learned it in financial services land back in the day in terms of the policies. I would take that person, person on the other side a little bit more seriously because I'm like, okay, this person is following some basic hygiene just by looking at the way they're sharing the documents or sharing the file. And I would want to trust, I, I just have a higher trust with that person than someone just sharing everything nilly willy and, and all over the place. So it it is a how you carry yourself in person. It is. Yeah, no, yeah. I totally agree with you. And it makes it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I and I think we we all well I looking at myself it can be sometimes guilty of being a little bit sloppy but um, it's good once you have a system and you stick with it it's important I um I just you were talking about that and I, I remember from I don't know maybe twenty something years ago I had a meeting with the CTO of Acer in uh, in Taipei oh, wow. just outside <laughs> of Taipei and um, and I had a folder. This is, you know, uh, with with printouts um, that had all the the notes, the customer notes, up to that point, um, but also with our financial projections and all kinds of internal sensitive information, and finished the meeting, walk got up and I left, took a taxi into town, and it was it was about a 45 minute taxi ride. I got out of the taxi and I realized, oh my gosh, I left the folder on his desk. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, that was, and so immediately I got a taxi back there and, um, and, you know, to get to his desk, I had to go through like three receptions because, you know, it's a big organization and, and, but they, you know, they knew that I'd just been there and I, I was like, you know, in a hurry and I, I, I he, he, he asked me to come back. <laughs> They're like, okay, go. And I walked in he, and uh, I walked into his office. He looked at me and, um, I said, I left my folder and I grabbed it and I said, thank you. Have a nice day. And that, to this day, I don't know if he a, took a look inside and it was just like, oh my God, you know, and you, you got to learn from those lessons. And it's the same thing. I mean, you know, whether you share something digitally or on file, you, you want to limit that or excuse me, via, uh, via um, some, some type of share, share document, you need to limit access. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Hey, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Cut you off. Yeah, I know. Um, I mean, it, we are working on some uh, free utilities uh, so uh, i would encourage the viewers to ch do check out our website around like auto expiring links which are older than a month auto expiring links which are older than six months so for individual google drives we will have a free we already have a google drive free version of individual users uh, but we will have these utilities built into it these apps um, so do check it out because we are uh, looking to kind of provide this uh, 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 gra uh, gra uh, non grata in terms of like as, as a value add for just regular uh, Joes out there. That's awesome. Hey, um, and I know we're kind of running up on our time here, but um, you know, any anything in the pipeline that you would like to discuss for the second half of 2022? Um, there's a bunch. Uh, we are we just released a. Uh, user risk course, so you can uh, we can provide a with fairly high accuracy in terms of who the highest risk users are in your organization. So the idea basically is that uh, as an infosec person, you try to just manage your human threat. Ninety percent of all breaches happen because of humans. So we are based on how you behave yourself on SaaS platforms. We can risk uh, bucket users from high to low. Uh, and that could be a good way to kind of mingle that in with your infosec security training um, and so on and so forth. So that's already out, um, basically. Um, in terms of uh, some of the other stuff, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, data protection around code bases um, in terms of just source code and who's, who's looking at it, who's committing, how is this being used or downstream people downloading it or, or, or using it. And those I know are uh, restricted uh, or crown deals for most companies. So that uh, we feel is, is is an area from an insider threat perspective is very alive and, and, and much needed uh, use cases there. Um, and then we are working on, uh, on a Gmail connector to be able to auto redact sensitive data. If someone is sending a file externally to people, they should not be sending it to, as an organization, you can create those kind of policies so a bunch of new and interesting things coming up uh, in the pipeline. Sounds very exciting. And, and I like the fact that all this can be um, deployed 
you know, because it, uh, simply via a no code platform. So I don't have to, you know, hire any developers. Um, I can just simply, you know, as you said, it takes a matter of minutes. Uh, I'm assuming for a larger enterprise, it takes more than minutes, but it's a, a relatively simple process. Um, so that's 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 awesome, and I think that's going to help you massively. Um, yes, sir. I, I've uh, really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned several things from you, and I so I appreciate your time. And I'd like to wish you and the rest of your team an amazing second half of 2022. Thank you, Mark. This was awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance.